The views expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Z Talk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. Listening to the Dark Shadows Radio with your host, Al Warren, only on the Z Talk Radio Network. Welcome to Dark Shadows. Tonight we have author, lecturer, and paranormal researcher, Darkness Dave Schrader. Everyone probably knows him from Darkness Radio. Tonight we're going to talk to Dave about his radio show, his contributing writing to TAPS Para Magazine, and all sorts of aspects of the paranormal, right after these words. Introducing the Starbucks Flat White, crafted with two ristretto shots for bolder, caramelly espresso. Whole milk, steamed to a sweet, velvety microphone. Delicately poured, so the espresso rises to the top. The perfect union of bold and sweet. Simplicity is its own artistry. You can listen to us anytime, anywhere now. Download our free app now for the iPhone and iPad. Look for the Warren Exchange or House of Mystery app at the Apple App Store today. I'm really psyched Subway's bringing the flavor with this new guacamole for a couple of reasons. First, people really love our guacamole. Rich and creamy made from Haas avocados and just a hint of jalapeno to keep it interesting. The other reason is, it's just really fun to say. Guacamole. 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 See? Come in and try our new guacamole on sandwiches like the Chipotle chicken melt and discover how it turns up the flavor on all your favorite sandwiches. Subway. Eat fresh. Ground control to Major Tom Ground control to Major Tom Take your protein pills and put your helmet on Ground control to Major Tom Seven Sing countdown engines on Two. Check ignition and may God's love be with you We interrupt this program to annoy you and make things generally irritating Holy mashed potatoes Danger, danger I said I want the truth you can't handle the truth. I said I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. We are back. And joining us now is Dave Schrader, Darkness Dave. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's uh, You guys are quite a team, uh, uh, quite an inspiration for a lot of us out there. Um, we really enjoy listening to you. Well, thank you. I appreciate hearing that. It's always nice to get feedback. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, and uh, it's quite interesting. Now, where did you actually... Um, start like as in what what made you get into paranormal you know i i don't think i got into the paranormal the paranormal got into me uh i've, I've been <laughs> followed around and badgered by the paranormal most of my life from ghost sightings to uh 
a Bigfoot sighting when I was a kid, two UFO sightings, um, you know, and, and a big one in Trout Lake, Washington back in 2006. So there's always been something, uh, you know, throughout my life. And, and my mom and aunts were avid readers, and they loved Stephen King and Dean Koontz, and they would read a lot of the real ghost stories, the books that came out from Ed and Lorraine Warren or D. Scott Rogo, Hans Holzer, you know, there was always something around to keep you inspired. Right, right. Was there a certain event that changed your life that made you kind of want to get um, get more knowledge about it? Just that I kept having things occur throughout my life. So I, I used to read whatever I could to try to understand what some of these things were. So there was no one that stuck out. I mean, the, the one that kind of was the catalyst was when I was very young. My grandmother would come to visit me after she passed away. And uh, I was so young, though, I have no physical memory of that, but I would tell my mom and aunt all about it. And, again, I, you know, I have no memory of that happening. I just I remember being older and them telling me about when I would talk about my, my dead grandmother. So, Wow. So now how has your uh, kind of prospect, your, your beliefs on, uh, on, as we say, ghosts or afterlife changed? since you've been doing the radio show? Yeah, I would say so. You know, from 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when we kind of formulate the idea of the show and, and after all of the experts I've spoken to and then reading as much into science and, and how things work, I, I don't know that I necessarily believe we're dealing with dead people in the sense of, you know, this ghosty figure that left a body and is now hanging around a location I think we're dealing a lot more with time slip phenomena and moments of you know just seeing through the veil of time and space yeah it's an interesting idea actually I, I, I sort of agree for the for the most part I always but the, you know seeing something you know someone from the future perhaps while they're looking at you you're searching and you kind of both cross paths. But why would people from the future in a time slip look back and not try to change things? Well, I, I don't know that A, it's long enough, or that B, we have enough of our faculties about us when we realize what's happening to, to do that. You know, I think sometimes it's just as surprising in these time slips. You know, I, I, I don't think it's something that people are necessarily trying to turn on and realize they're about to communicate with the past or the future. I think it's they're mistaking it for what they think are ghosts, which would explain why the ghosts that we sometimes see are more frightened of us than we are of them. Why do they take off running? Right? Yeah. Why do they see us and act just as surprised or terrified? Well, because they're not dead. To them, we're the ghosts, and usually there's not much of a window to communicate back and forth uh, because one, the other, or both are extremely surprised at that moment and uh, just want to get the hell away from whatever they're experiencing. Yeah. And, and so do you think that uh, then there are no ghosts ever? Like, do you, do you think as we pass, that means we just go somewhere else and we're not? We're I, not think that's, I think that's the truth. I think when we die, we're gone and we go to wherever we're going to go or we cease to exist or whatever your belief system is. But I, you know, I know people say, well, but uh, you know, we saw this and I've seen things, you know, and I saw my grandmother's ghost too. So there must be something to it. And I've had, you know, I've had dream visitations. I, I just, I, I'm what people would refer to as a skeptical believer. I've had experiences, but I don't believe everything I hear I don't even necessarily always believe everything I've experienced. I, I question, you know, we're, we're good friends with this husband and wife team called the Intrigue Theater, and they're an amazing medium and illusion uh, show. And uh, they, I, you know that you're there to see illusions. You know that you're there to see magic tricks and, and to be fooled. But they'll do things that you wrap you can't wrap your head around and and I watch people that walk into the show that know what kind of show they're coming to at the end of the show they're asking them how long they've been seeing ghosts and how long did they talk to ghosts and 
even though they're there for that reason, they are still tricked and fooled to believe that these things are taking place. And I think it's because our want and desire to experience something greater than what we are or what is our normal supersedes all other things for us. And we, you know, we sometimes maybe rationally will give up on logic thoughts and, and take to flights of fancy because it's more exciting and it's it's exhilarating and it gives us hope that there's something beyond this plane. So now the, 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 of recent, there's sure been a lot of um, mediums that have come out. There's a lot of mediums now. Sure. And uh, do, do, do you think that it's all sort of the exposure? What do you think they're seeing and what do you think they're crossing? Because most of them come across as quite um, connected to the to your past loved ones or, you know. Uh, sure. Uh, or when you go to a reading and there's it's a, a whole crowd, they pick out people and yeah, sure. There's I'm sure there's charlatans, and there's real ones. But um, so are they just connecting with time slips as well? You think or I, no? Here's here's what I believe is most likely what's going on. I believe that it is truly a sixth sense, a sense that we have not normally developed or are not aware of or capable of noticing very well yet. That may be the next wave of our development as humans is some people have it, some people have had it, more people seem to be getting it, maybe it's an awakening, but I, I believe what they're experiencing is the energy that we carry with us, right? It, as our lives go and we experience things, we capture these memories and these moments in time and we file them away and they're in our memory they're part of our records they're part of who we are and what makes us up now science is is even looking into the fact that we may carry genetic memory which means something that our great great grandfather or mother did may be carried down through our gene pool and we remember and we have those memories which would explain how we could know something about somebody we never met because it was there but a good psychic or medium may just be able to reach into that file cabinet and pull forth that index card and read aloud what it's seeing and not realize that that's what they're doing because they're seeing physical manifestations of what we have with us. They're, they're seeing the memories, they're seeing the, the idea of these people, and, and I think that that may be more of what's going on and I, I i don't know if that if i'm being very clear on that but that that's what i think is happening i think it's more of a development of an extra sense yeah that just yeah. allows us to tap into each other in our own energies well and that comes which is nonetheless any i mean that's an amazing feat unto itself right i mean right. it's you know not being dismissive of their amazing talents it's just that i don't know that it's really dead people they're talking to yeah, and I've heard, I've talked with some people, like, I I think you've had Kevin Sullivan as well, hey? And uh, he's kind of under right. the impression that we talk to demons, um, the, that that there's no real dead people, it's just demons and stuff. So um, there's a lot of ideas on that. Uh, right, well, demons, or right, and, and again, what is everybody's definition yeah. of what takes place, you know? So, some people, and listen, I, you know, I, we started doing true crime on our show three years ago, and I had become a much more paranoid and dark human because of it. Uh, you know, I'm looking over my shoulder constantly. If I go into a movie theater and one guy walks in by himself and sits in a row and he's shifting around and his eyes look shifty, I'm automatically in panic mode, you know, inside because of what we experience and what we see. Well, if you're always looking for demons and if you're brought up with the theological aspect and background, then that may be what it is you experience. But when we've talked, you know, and, and when I'm at large events and I'll do talks about the paranormal and people will ask me about the demonic and I say, why do you believe it was demonic? Well, you know, it knocked three times. I said, so did it in the song, and that meant that it loved you, right? Knock three <laughs> times on the ceiling if you love me. So how is it that we could, um, that, we, you know, we make this next leap, this next jump, that it's something much more nefarious? Well, because it's the opposite of 
the Antichrist or of the Christ. It's it's mocking the Holy Trinity. So it's knocking three times. Well, that seems like a ridiculous aspect, yeah. right? right. Uh, and, and it happened at three in the morning. So does that mean that demons and ghosts subscribe to the daylight savings time plan? <laughs> if time is irrelevant to them over there, then why do they wait for those moments? Um, so you hear a banging, three bangs, and that makes it evil. Well, I tell people, close your eyes. Imagine you're walking up to the front door of your friend's house, and the doorbell says, doorbell is out, please knock. Now reach out your hand and knock. Doom, doom, doom. Almost everybody reaches out and knocks three times. It's the way our brain works. It's the patterns. We do that or we do the dun, da, da, dun, 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 right? There's some kind of rhythmic idea or memory to what we do. So there, that's debunked for me. I don't believe that we're hearing it. Maybe it's a residual. Maybe it's a sound of the house settling. The two most active times in a ho- in a house are in the mid afternoon and the middle you know of the night when it's hottest and coldest when things are going to swell from the heat or contract from the cold and give you these sounds and if you've walked certain patterns on your carpet and and floors all day long every day for years at night as the as the wood settles you're going to maybe hear the cracking and popping in the set of the footsteps that you would normally hear someone walking i don't jump or or prescribe to the fact that it's always demonic or evil just because we hear it and you know what i don't get scratched i don't get attacked i don't get my hair pulled which i have none of but that's why i keep it cut cut short that way nothing can grab me and yank me to the fiery pits of hell i guess but uh you know, the demonic, it, it's, I think it's something that people bring on themselves in most cases because of their belief system. Yeah. So it's coming and, to, to your intent more than... Uh, right. So that kind of uh, could apply to everything from uh, Ouija boards to... Uh, oh, exactly. Yeah, everybody wants to say the Ouija board is evil. The Ouija board is plastic and cardboard. If that was evil, they would have you know gotten rid of Monopoly years ago. Uh, that game ties you into a six-hour marathon that you end up hating your friends and relatives. To me, that is much more evil than Ouija has ever been, right? Yeah. Uh, Ouija is, is nothing more than a tool, and it's how you use the tool. And if you allow the tool to get into your head, I, you know, I, I ask people as a show of hands at a convention, how many people here have played the Ouija? And they'll raise their hands, and I say, great. Okay, how many of you played it at a party the first time? And most of the people have their hands raised. I said, and if you didn't play it at a party, how many of you played it between you and your best friend and you were trying to scare each other and, you know, you were going to try to talk to somebody creepy and most of the other people raised their hands. And I said, right, we all went into it with the expectations of it being a frightening moment. And and can we talk to ghosts? And maybe you're doing it at a party where you're going to snuggle up a little bit closer to that guy or gal that you like. Um, Maybe you're doing it to try to impress somebody. So when you're going into it with those thoughts and that activity, then you might have a different, you know, experience. You've got other people who have written entire books transcribing them through the use of Ouija board. So, you know, it's not always a negative experience, and it depends on how you use it. I said, if it starts getting to the point where it's abusive, it's a game. Put it back in the box, put the lid on the box, and if you want to punish it, stick it underneath the game of life for the irony and let it realize where it's at, right? Right. You don't... You don't wake up and hear that the Ouija board's marching its way down the hall, stalking people, throwing the planchette at them, forcing them to play it again. You know, that that doesn't happen. You have control. And I think that's what people have to realize is they have to take their power back when it comes to the paranormal and their fears. Um, it, it just, you know, again, fears, false evidence appearing real, yeah. right? It's It's the assumption and it's the the thought process that you put into it to make it seem real. And here's, you know, what uh, Jeff Belanger and I have joked, and if we do die and we're able to hang out as a ghost, do you know who the first people are I'm going to screw with? The ones that are afraid of ghosts. Because I'm a smartass, and that's who I am and what I do. So I'll be the guy that creeps up behind you and pushes the planchette to say, die. I'm not a demon, although my kids might fight you on that on occasion. But, you know, I... (laughs) I'm not evil, but I will play the game, and, and, you know, so in life, so in death, you know, if that's truly the case. But I I think there's a lot more to do with our own will and our own 
mind to using most of the tools that we use, from electronic tools all the way down to Ouija boards and dowsing rods and, and uh, crystals and so on and so forth. I think there's a lot more of the human element involved than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah, so you do think that maybe a lot of those tools uh, that people are using um, are, are really influenced by the people using them. Right. Yeah. And so, so do you think that the, the, the modern TV shows and promotions of, of a lot of the paranormal and ghost hunters and all that sort of thing is kind of a good thing or is it kind of making it a, a little less, um, I don't know, realistic for, for the common person? There are people that have had experiences their whole life or have even had just one experience and they've never felt comfortable talking about it because people would roll their eyes or call them crazy or, or make fun of them. By having a paranormal show on every channel, as we've had happen, from science, you know, the sci-fi channel to CBS, NBC, CW, Fox, uh, even to the animal planet has their own paranormal shows it has kind of torn back that veil and more people talk about it and it's not this hidden embarrassing potentially embarrassing thing anymore it's part of who we are and our own human experience so i think it's good in that sense that it's made people more comfortable talking about their experiences than it ever has in the past uh you know like anything in moderation everything's good um too much is always a bad thing and when you you know each show feels the need to try to one up the show that came before it and looking for interesting angles and and what they're doing and what, what is the intent you know I've been reached out over the 10 years I've been reached out to repeatedly from television networks and production companies and they want me to be a part of their shows and in no uncertain terms, they'll basically tell me, you know, don't worry if nothing happens, we can fix that in post. And, and I, I, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, we can add effects. And, and uh, what do you mean? If it doesn't happen, you're going to add that? Well, we can. And, and so you're willing to fake this. Well, you know, it's an entertainment venue that we're doing. This is a TV show. And, and I've avoided a lot of shows because of that. Um, you know, I did. I've been on Ghost Adventures, uh, Ghost Adventures, numerous times. I like those guys; they're like brothers to me. And what I've been there to see and witness is exactly what you see appear on the TV show. And I've never once seen an, uh, something added that didn't happen at the time. I've never once, you know, witnessed anything that was out of the ordinary. So I'm, I'm comfortable being a part of that show. And, uh, you know, uh, unless something ever changes with that, I don't see that ever being a problem for me. So I don't really think TV is a bad aspect of the paranormal. Can it make paranormal investigating look silly and dumb? Sure. Right? But yeah. even guys like Dr. Oz, who are known as experts in their field, have some blemishes, don't they? And they, they get other doctors that will speak up against them and, and make them look ridiculous. I think it just comes with the territory of being out in the public eye and doing what we do. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever had an experience when you're on one of those hunts that have kind of um, really kind of terrified you or really left you unsure of what happened? When we were on uh, the episode of Rolling Hills Asylum with Ghost Adventures, and I think it was like their season two uh, episode, I went in, I'd been there before, and, you know, we'd had experiences with shadow people and really weird EVP. So, with that said, we, you know, I talked to the boys and told them how active it was, and they invited me to be a part of the episode. And I said, sure, I'd love to. I, I wish I would have understood better what I was agreeing to do. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're very real. When they go in and lock themselves down, they lock themselves down. They're the only ones in that building during the lockdown. So I had to sit out offset in a van for three and a half hours until they were ready for me and uh, sat there in the dark, you know, yeah. outside of uh, <laughs> Rolling Hills Asylum. But then they finally called for me and brought me in and 
you know, the guys were really excited. There was so much activity going on, and I thought, come on, I've been here. There's no way there's this much activity going on for these guys. And that, you know, that was the first time I filmed with them, and I thought, oh, crap, don't only find out by, you know, one of my favorite shows, these guys are, are fakes or frauds. You know, and, and that was a real concern. And then when we went in there, it was just all hell had broken loose. We're standing there just set up, and you could hear footsteps running from one end of the hall to the other. You could hear moans. And at one point, as we're all geared up, and Nick is standing off to my left, and he's got a video camera on his shoulder, uh, on his right shoulder, I believe it was. Aaron is standing in front of me, and he's got a video camera facing me, and Zach is standing off in front of me and a little bit up to my uh, left in front. And we're just chatting, and we suddenly hear this blood-curdling scream come from the end of the hall. And as I turn, Nick is still facing towards me. Over his shoulder, in the dark, I see this creepy white face. It almost looked like the Pazuzu face hmm. from The Exorcist. And as Nick turned to look down the hall, this face folded back over his shoulder, almost like it was on a hinge, and it just went straight back. That was one of the more terrifying moments for me because I was totally unprepared for something like that. And to have it on the heels of all this running around sound and these blood-curdling screams and things that took place. And, you know, sadly, none of it was caught on video. They weren't running their cameras at the time. We were just getting set to start filming. <laughs> and that went on. And we caught other things that occurred in the in the building. But that was one of the, you know, my truly holy poop moments and, yeah. and really kind of unnerved me for a while. But... Uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't frighten me to go into these locations because, you know, it might unnerve me a little bit. I might be a little, un, you know, on at ease, but uh, people say, don't you get frightened? And I'm like, well, do you get frightened when you go to the zoo and see animals? And they're like, no, why? And I go, exactly, because I went there looking for this. If I was sitting in my living room watching TV and the Headless Horseman walked in, I'm going to have the same reaction of everybody else and scream and try to crawl out the window. But when I go into the environment seeking this, I'm much more prepared for it. Yeah. So it's not quite as terrifying. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's probably safer than going to the movie theater. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, I saw a full-on shadow person at Waverly Hills Sanitarium that just walked up and through me. Uh, so that was really crazy. Um, a, sh a shadow person. So you're thinking that's another time slip itself or... Uh... Well, people, again, people will automatically assume it's a shadow person, so it must be uh, evil. It must be evil or dark or, or bad because it's it's black, right? Yeah. And I, maybe that's all the energy that's left of that memory, of that vision of whatever's taking place there, and that's why it plays through, and that's, that's it. There's just no more detail left to it, like a fading picture, uh, you know, or, you know, like a, a receipt. Get a receipt from Target or Walmart and fold it up and put it in your pocket. And you know, two weeks later, your your body heat and it rubbing around, it's faded to where you can barely see what's still on that slip. I think that's more of what we deal with when it comes to shadow people. Now, I know there are other claims of more malevolent shadow people and ones with glowing red eyes. I've never encountered that, so I can't answer to it. But I think what we're literally seeing in most cases are shadows through space and time of just something that's going on there at that particular moment. Yeah. Yeah, and now the UFO um, phenomenon, it, it doesn't seem to get, um, it's still not as quite open as uh, paranormal and ghosts. Uh, what, what do you think the reason for that is? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think it's just as open. Well, uh, what I mean is I think that more people are a little bit, they're still, sh they're still shy of talking about um, being abducted. I mean, it's there, but it's not. It's not to the same level. Maybe because with that, there's there is more of a dark force involved in stories and involve things that we have no control over. So here's here's something. You know, presidents and congressmen and senators can roll their eyes and laugh at ghost stories. And it's something that's been around forever and has been a part of our lexicon. I mean, there's, you know, books back into the 15, 14, 15, 1600s where they talk about ghosts. There's ghosts in the Bible. So that's just part of, of our culture. UFOs are a more new 
kind of experience, right? I mean, it's really since the 40s and 50s that these have become part of our our pop culture and part of what we are. Well, they also bring about a totally different presence and a threat. And the reason I don't think it's taken as seriously from the other aspects is because, you know, obviously it has. Every president pretty much from the 50s on has talked about UFOs and has had an interest in UFOs and has either witnessed UFO or promised to get to the bottom of UFOs. And nothing ever comes of it. Well, because if you admit and agree to the fact that something, some power, some force can make it here from other planets or galaxies, and they may have ill intent or a malevolent nature, you don't really want to accept that. It's not something that we can prove to people. You know, if we came up with some kind of laser grid sky thing that we could put up over our planet, we could prove that it would stop anything trying to get in, then they'd be all about it. They'd love to brag about that, but they don't have any power to stop something like this. Mm-hmm. So I think they're very cautious in the way that it's released and talked about. Uh, and then kind of making a joke of it is more trying to keep themselves in control than us ignorant. If if they feel like, you know, they don't take it seriously and, and we get that sense, then maybe there's not as much reality to it. But I think I think there's a lot more going on with the UFO culture than, than people give credit to as well. Right. It just seems a little bit more, I don't know if you want to say private, um, f- for the most part, I think. Um, what's your belief on UFOs? Well, to look out at, at our vast sky and and not believe that there's life somewhere else to me seems pretty ridiculous. Um, and we are explorers by nature, right? I mean, we we've left the lands from which we were born and we've moved across a globe and past that globe to the moon and now to Mars and talking about actually bringing man to Mars, why wouldn't other species have the same feel? And if there are other species that predate ours by millions of years, maybe they've already done that. Maybe they've been there. Maybe we are them. Maybe we are the children of these other planets. Um, uh, you know, so I, I think that we'd be stupid and ignorant to not believe that there's something else going on out there. Yeah, and you had um, some episodes on the uh, ancient aliens debunked and that. Uh, right. Ha- ha- what were your thoughts on that? Like, how did that come out for you? I'm sorry about that. What was that? I was what are my s- thoughts on that? Yeah, how did it come out for you? Like, did you come out thinking maybe a lot of it was debunked? A lot of the cases, yes, I, I think a lot of the stories of the pyramids, and, you know, it's really fanciful to believe that alien cultures came down here to help us build pyramids. To what reason, I, I don't understand. But because we want to, you know, again, maybe not give credit where credit is due and realize that ancient people maybe had it together a lot more than we thought they did, and they had a better understanding and idea of engineering than we thought they did, and may have a better understanding and, and idea of engineering than we do now. Uh, you know, not every great mystery is always handed down from one generation to another of how things are done. And that may have been lost in the annals of time and space. So then we give it, you know, a, a, a supernatural feel. It must be alien in, in nature, too, of how we, you know, how we created these things and, and were guided to create these things. There are some really weird aspects, you know, that the Mayan, Aztec, and Egyptian ruins are built in very similar patterns, very similar ways. All around the world, these different places, these outcroppings popped up that had that going on. Why did they build them this way? How did they do that? But, you know, the science also talks about the hundred monkey rule, right? Once the hundredth monkey looks at a stick and realizes, hey, if I stick, if I take this stick and I stick it into the anthill, and hold it there, the ants will climb up the stick, and then I can use it to eat the ants. As soon as that hundred monkey does that, it becomes like an awakening across the planet, and monkeys that have never done that start picking up sticks and sticking them into anthills. It's like a global consciousness and an awakening that that takes place. Um, So I think that, you know, sometimes there's just this awakening of, of how we progress and how we naturally make it to the next level. Yeah, quite interesting. The um, now your true crime. Um, what made you start to co- kind of follow that on your show? True 
crime uh, fascinates me. Um, a little over 20 years ago, uh, my very first girlfriend from high school, uh, who I'd remained friends with, uh, was brutally murdered, and her baby, unborn baby, was stolen from her. They cut her open and took the baby out, and then murdered two of her other children. And, you know, that really shocked me to have that kind of experience happen in my world. It wasn't just something that you see on TV and happens to other people. Suddenly that invaded my world. And I wanted to understand why. What what would make one person do something that heinous? But there were three people involved in this, one of them being the father of the baby. Mm-hmm. And, and that might be dark and weird enough, but then that his cousin and his cousin's girlfriend were in on it so that they could steal the baby because she had been fixed and she wanted to have more children with him and they wanted a light-skinned baby and, you know, my friend Deborah was white and and her boyfriend at the time was black so they had this very light-skinned child coming and, you know, that they plotted and methodically planned this for nine months and that the woman faked her own pregnancy during that time and put on weight and and talked about her being pregnant and it just it it baffled me how people's minds worked and who is the enemy who is a criminal and where does this come from so i've i've been fascinated by that i've watched documentaries and shows for years and and uh, read about the cases and, and from time to time we would do these weird unsolved mystery cases and and strange uh, crimes that seem to have a bit of a supernatural slant to them and people really responded and to be truthful it was a nice way to break up the week and, and do something a little different so we decided you know let's let's Tuesdays dedicate to true crime and we'll talk about true crimes that have supernatural slants we'll talk about true crimes of unsolved mysteries we'll we'll just kind of cover that gambit and see if we can get into the mindset of understanding things a little more and people it seems to resonate with people and they enjoy the the stories and, and looking at these cases and where it uh, where it takes you and the big case now Steve Avery right <laughs> um, kind of have you have you come up with different impressions have you watched the making of a murderer well you know we did an interview uh, about the case oh, geez, like six seven months ago on our show on darkness radio and it was a fascinating interview, and it was just compelling radio to hear this whole twisted story. And it's one of those that just left me shocked and amused. And, and you know, then this documentary series came up, and it kind of exploded again. So I have not had a chance to power through all ten episodes. I'll be doing that this week because I'll be talking about the Stephen Avery case on Coast to Coast AM this Saturday. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the case itself. I'm fascinated by the way the mind works, and even who's the bad guy, who's the good guy in that case. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> here you've got a, a, a criminal, but then who's the real criminal? Is it the the law enforcement and the court systems that are failing this man? Is it the person that did the crime? Where, where does it all come down? And that's that's really frightening to me. That whole aspect, and when you start to look at like through the Innocence Project, they believe that there is an average of 200 people wrongfully convicted in every state. I mean, wrap your head around that. Yeah, it's crazy. 200 people yeah. in every state, 50 states, that's a lot of people yeah. that are doing jail time for crimes they did not commit. And science is now helping. But it's also a hindrance because in the sense that there are all of these rape kits that have been sent in. And the police and the labs just don't have the man hours and time to process them all, which has left real rapists and killers and and uh, criminals on the run while those rape tests sit untested. These DNA tests sit in in boxes, unable to proceed because there's just not enough man hours, and, and that that's not the case they're working on right now. Yeah, yes. And some people have been exonerated because of DNA testing, and they get the luck of the draw, and, and another DNA test is done and matches with something that happened elsewhere, and they can suddenly remove the crime. But it's it's 
to me that that's also so fascinating and I, I watch the way the law which is set up to protect us how it works and it seems that the law has a huge flaw in it when it comes to court and it's not about justice and serving justice it's about attorneys winning or losing and yeah. that's all that's important yeah it's a human flaw um, right. you, you can see it quite often and uh, I think what the series shows is how and I think that's why people are so upset uh, the series definitely covers on how bad the system worked because whether you think he did the second murder or not that, that trial was just uh, not it's just not acceptable you know but yeah it's 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 it, it's more frightening to me than most of the paranormal stories I hear to be honest with you yeah it makes you wonder I think you have to be more scared of some of the humans alive than the ones dead oh right yeah it's you the know. fleshies that frighten me it's not the uh, the ghosts <laughs> yeah yeah and speaking of that was is it was sad news about David Bowie today hey oh yeah horrible uh, it's it's such a tragedy to have uh, to have lost him you know I mean what a great talent and you know it was, it was quite a shock you know, just, yeah just a guy I respected in his music and acting and and uh, overall just the way he led his life was uh, inspiring to many and you know he didn't let downfalls get to him and didn't didn't take himself out of the race for being unique and 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 uh, different he embraced it and made a career of it yeah yeah quite a loss so so what's next for uh, Dave Schrader uh, well, I think a uh, ham sandwich and maybe a nice cup of soup. <laughs> uh, then maybe watching a couple more episodes of uh, Making a Murderer. Uh, other than that, it's just, you know, I, I, I'm loving what I do now. And, uh, you know, I'm a full-time dad. I'm a, a researcher and uh, location scout for Ghost Adventures TV series. Um, and then doing the nightly radio show and filling in on weekends from time to time on Coast to Coast. It's that's pretty much what I'm working on. There's a few other little irons in the fire, and, and I'd like to finish up a couple of these book ideas that I have and, and maybe work as a correspondent on a few other things that I'm working on. So we'll, we'll see how it unfolds. But it's it's an adventure, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Lots of work for you. I will mention one thing we do have uh, coming up in June. We'll be doing a, a trip with listeners, and, and, and I'll extend that invitation out to your listeners that uh, we're going to be doing a... Uh, Frankenstein field trip to Germany and Prague that will be taking place this uh, uh, June 20th through the 27th. There's information on our site. You get to go to haunted castles and hotels and crypts and ghosts and mummies and demons. And we're going to be doing a lot of research in, in historic and haunted spots. So it's a great opportunity and it's limited. We're keeping it to the first 30 to 40 people to sign up and uh, it'll be a great time. But that's all at darknessevents.com. Darkness events.com and you can find out where you can see me along the line I'll be uh, visiting quite a few other locations throughout the year so it'd be great to uh, to say hi fantastic well um, thank you very much I know your busy schedule and you lots to do and yeah uh, <laughs> well thank you for having me on I appreciate it yeah it's been great thank you all right have a great day <laughs> The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. If you're lying to me, I'll be back.